This video is brought to you by Display. Hey Wisecrack, Chris here to talk about a game that fits right in with 2020, in that it pretty much let everybody down. Cyberpunk 2077 was one of the most anticipated releases in recent memory, and then, well, I will find you. But we're not here to talk about the game's many, many bugs, hilarious or otherwise. And we're not here to talk about the game's marketing promises, launch, crunch, or lawsuits. There are other channels out there that can do that better than us. But assuming you can actually get the game to run, you'll find that Cyberpunk is chock full of references to philosophy. Everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Marcus Aurelius, I think. To literature. For whom the bell tolls. Ernest Hemingway. And other games. I'm going to kill you and all the cake is gone. Clearly Cyberpunk thinks it's pretty smart, but is it as smart as it thinks it is? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on Cyberpunk 2077. Deep or dumb and spoilers ahead. But before we get into it, I wanna give a huge shout out to this week's sponsor, Displate. Displate is a one of a kind metal poster designed to capture your unique passions. With thousands of designs to choose from, you can show off artwork from your favorite books, movies, TV shows, and even games. Their licensed collections are beautiful and include images of characters you love from Marvel to DC to Star Wars and more. They sent me this awesome Last of Us 2 display because even if you didn't like the story, you have to agree that the game is beautiful. The finish is awesome and I love that it will never get creases or rip like a traditional poster. If you're interested in decorating with other designs, they also have an epic collection of nature, space, and animal images. Disc plates are great because they are made out of sturdy canvas and magnet mounted, which means you can set them up in 20 seconds, no tools required, and no damage done. If you use my link, you can get 21% off one display or 31% off two. So click the link below and hurry since this offer won't last. Now, back to the show. And now, to boil down a very expansive game into a watchable video, we're gonna focus on one of the game's biggest themes. What does it even mean to be, well, me? And that question brings us to the first maybe deep idea. Cyberpunk explores philosopher John Locke's theory of identity. To understand how, we need to look at the game's premise, which is actually pretty simple. After a heist gone wrong, the protagonist, V, ends up with a digitized version of someone else's consciousness in their head. That person is one Johnny Silverhand, a legendary rocker who died 50 years ago. But sharing isn't always caring, because it just so happens that Silverhand's consciousness is slowly overriding V's. In other words, Every minute, there's a little less of V's mind and a little more of Johnny's, until V is gone and Mr. Silverhand gets to claim his body as legitimate salvage. Of course, this raises all kinds of questions like, what does it mean for me to be me and you to be you? And what does it mean if my brain is half me and half a guy who can really pull off aviators? Oh, Sokka's still a despotic machine and the world's on a collision course with chaos. Weirdly enough, this unsettling prospect is actually very similar to a question posed over 300 years ago by John Locke, well before the invention of both the internet and aviators. Locke asked the hypothetical, if a prince's soul is transported into the body of a cobbler, is it really the same prince? Or what if two consciousnesses inhabit the same body? Or if one consciousness inhabits multiple bodies? Incidentally, these are exactly the kinds of scenarios that Cyberpunk repeatedly poses throughout the game. In one mission, you face off against two bodies who share the same consciousness to much confusion. One, one person, person two, bodies. two bodies. In a bit of a reverse scenario, an AI-driven cab service named Delamain fragments into multiple personalities. We meet an anxious Delamain. Of it, the city, the bustle, the crowds. It's overwhelming. A murderous Delamain. Try to take me and I'll crush you! A portal joke Delamain. Your specimen has been processed. And we are now ready to begin the test problem. And yet, they're all kind of still Delamain? Now, Locke's ideas on identity stand in stark contrast to another philosopher directly referenced in the game, Rene Descartes. For Descartes, identity exists not in the physical brain, but in the thinking mind or the soul. In other words, you can't go dissecting a human brain and find a soul, but this mysterious essence still makes you, well, you. This is the source of the phrase Cartesian dualism which inspired the in-game band, the Cartesian Duelists. One side of that duality is the physical material body, the other is an immaterial mind slash soul that does all of our thinking. The game's nod to Descartes is pretty straightforward. The immaterial mind of Johnny Silverhand is retained in digital code. That might not be exactly what Descartes meant by soul, but the game doesn't really explore the nuances here. Instead, it's implied that digital Johnny is the same as his mortal self. Now, if this game was straight up endorsing the Cartesian worldview, it'd all be pretty simple. Johnny has a soul, 
V has a soul. We can call it a day. Wow, philosophy's pretty easy. Just kidding. It's not quite that simple, especially for John Locke, who complicated the ideas of identity with his aforementioned thought experiments. You can't just transport someone's soul into a different body and call it the same person. I mean, consider this. If V woke up in a landfill with no prior memories, is he still the same person? You might say, well, yeah, same body, same brain, same person. Locke would disagree. He posed a simple hypothetical. Say you've inherited the soul of Socrates, reincarnated over a few millennia. However, you don't remember pestering Athenians or drinking hemlock. For Locke, regardless of the soul, you would not be Socrates. According to Locke, identity rests in the consciousness and memory. To put it simply, if you experience things and remember experiencing things as yourself, congrats, you're you. If V woke up in that landfill with no memories, he'd be a different person. If software Johnny is capable of thought, but can't remember his mortal self, he's a different person. But if he can remember, then he's the same. Now, this whole discussion might seem tangential to the game, because it kind of is. Cyberpunk doesn't really explore the ramifications of either Descartes or Locke's theory of identity. It likes raising the same kinds of questions entertained by these philosophers, but it doesn't exactly know what to do with them. I have similar dreams sometimes, that you never die, that I'm you. Which is a shame, because the game gets so close to exploring these philosophies in its main question. Like Johnny taking over V's body is exactly the kind of question Locke posed. Should we hold V accountable for the actions of Johnny? If not, does that mean we should forgive the actions of a drunk driver who doesn't remember crashing? Now, does playing through scenarios that are pretty similar to those explored by an English philosopher make the game smart? Not quite. I think to be deep, it would really have to explore more of the implications and consequences of these ideas. Like, Johnny taking your body for a ride isn't really in service of some grand statement on identity any more than if he borrowed your car instead and wrecked it. At least, not so far. Also, the whole digitization of consciousness isn't super original either. It's a conceit borrowed from cyberpunk novels like Neuromancer with its character Dixie Flatline. And hey, borrowing is fine. We love the library, but that doesn't make you a genius. So let's consider the second idea that might make cyberpunk deep. Everything you know about identity is wrong. Forget Locke, forget Descartes, because this is cyberpunk, baby. And one thing the genre loves to do is confuse categories like human, machine, self, and other, or man and woman. The cyberpunk genre is all about taking our preconceptions about identity and smashing them to bits. And this game gets interesting because it confuses the simple categories of self and other. For instance, there's that guy with one consciousness and two bodies. So, who do I got first? No, no, you don't get it. That body and this one, I'm the same person. And there's sex workers who can go on autopilot while servicing clients and then erase their memory after the job is done. Do they become someone else for that window of time, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? In a later mission, a similar autopilot makes them really good at killing people. Let the behavioral chip do what it wants. So where does the person stop and the software begin? Things get hazy. But is this deep? To figure it out, we'll need the help of philosopher Gilles Deleuze, who we think might even have an in-game item named after him. Along with his co-author, Félix Guattari, Deleuze wanted to rework our notion of identity from a simple being into what he called becoming. What does that mean? It stresses that fixed identity doesn't exist and that it's always in motion in connection with all of one's surroundings that are also in motion. In this view, it's not that Johnny and V are two separate entities, each with their own personal identity. Instead, they're both becoming each other. Consider for instance, that as a player, this intruder into your brain slowly becomes your ally if played a certain way. Of course I can see. Want me to hand over the keys. I wanna save your life. Maybe you once thought his raging against the machine was evil and terroristic, but after you deal with the Arasaka Corporation, he starts making a lot of sense. On a neurological level, you are becoming Johnny. But even without him rewriting your brain, you enter into a relationship that changes both of you. To understand this a little bit, we could consider Deleuze's discussion of the orchid and the wasp. For a TLDR, orchids reproduce through some evolutionary trickery. The wasp tries to uh, romance the orchid, becoming an unwitting carrier of its pollen. And the orchid, for its part, gives out pheromones to mimic a female wasp. In this way, the wasp becomes unsuspectingly co-opted into the orchid's reproductive apparatus. In that moment, it's becoming orchid, while the orchid is becoming wasp. The larger point is that identity, for Deleuze, is often a function of large complicated processes and networks of interaction and identity. We can't understand who V is without considering their background be it a street kid, nomad, or corpo, and how their social networks and society itself slowly informs their identity. This point is arguably raised by Johnny as he discusses how one's personality can be changed without one even knowing it. 
Remember where you used to be, then think what you've done lately. Or earlier, your partner in crime, Jackie Wells, muses about the fact that he has no choices. He is simply a cog in a larger machine. Hey, well, it's not some palace in Japan. I didn't have no choices. While we may like to think of our choices as being uniquely ours, this character suggests that autonomy might not be so autonomous. At the same time, the game immerses us in a world saturated with advertising, which can also change our thoughts and behaviors by appealing to our basest desires. Deleuze used the term assemblage to describe this level of social complexity, an arrangement of things where everything is constantly in flux. If that sounds like a stretch, and it might be, consider Johnny's guitar called the Deleuze Orpheon. Orpheon is seemingly a reference to Orpheus, the legendary ancient Greek musician who went through the underworld and then returned. Get it? It's Johnny. And we don't know for sure if Deleuze is a sly misspelled reference to the philosopher, but we couldn't find any possible interpretation besides a champagne cognac brand, so maybe it's on purpose? But importantly, this becoming an assemblage business for Deleuze doesn't merely amount to things are complicated. It speaks to the breaking down of identity categories and the fluidity of all things. Deleuze and those influenced by his work, like philosopher Donna Haraway, argue that, for instance, delineation between man and animal, or man and machine, is a fiction. Even if we're not Adam Smasher, yet, there are plenty of cyborgs, combinations of human and machine, running around with pacemakers and eyeglasses. And sure, the game messes with identity a bit, like when two characters merge consciousness for a romantic encounter too steamy to show on YouTube, or in its open-ended character creation. And while the game gives us plenty of scenarios that question binaries like self versus other, they kind of slot it in, as if to say, wouldn't this be wild? And sometimes these scenarios are just lifted from the cyberpunk genre itself, like the sex workers who practically become someone else. This conceit is, once again, more or less lifted from the OG cyberpunk novel, Neuromancer. And the game usually ends up treating these instances as exceptions to the rule, rather than really breaking down categories. It's a doll, or a proxy. In the end, despite quotes about how you and Johnny are becoming more alike, Know what? You're starting to remind me of me, 50 years back. All the endings really stress the salience of your individual identities. What's more, all of the game's endings still set up a choice between V and Johnny. In other words, which person's consciousness, a la Locke, gets to keep the body? Sure, Johnny might learn a thing or two from V, but this isn't a questioning of our identity any more than it's just a character arc. Even the last line in one of the Johnny endings stresses the way living in V's consciousness has changed him. Haven't forgotten a thing, never will. But this sentiment could just as easily be about a dead friend who didn't happen to share a body with you. So if this game wants to be about Deleuze and Becoming, it's being a little dumb about it. But now it's time for what is perhaps the most airtight interpretation of them all. Cyberpunk is about aging and personal identity, and also this thing called the Ship of Theseus. To lay it out briefly, the experience of someone slowly overwriting your brain as you disappear while they take over may actually just be akin to the normal process of getting old. Like if 12 year old me's consciousness was implanted into my brain, we might have just as hard of a time as Johnny and V. This is pretty explicit in the game. In one dialogue option, a character explains that you're always becoming someone else every day, relic virus or otherwise. You're already becoming someone else. Every second of every day. And in a mission where you reunite Johnny's old band, Denny remarks that she feels like she has to pretend that she's a younger version of herself, a version that is now completely alien to her. How are you feeling ahead of the show? Weird, like I'm about to pretend to be myself. Now all this is embodied by an old philosophical paradox known as the ship of Theseus. In short, it's a thought experiment that asks you to consider a ship that, like all ships, undergoes repairs. But over the years, as each plank is removed and replaced with a new one, it adds up, and that ship eventually no longer has any of the original materials. Is it the same ship? Locke, in his theory of identity, would say yes. Even if you were to consider a person who, atom by atom, is continually replaced, they still have the same conscious memories and thus are the same person. But Cyberpunk isn't so sure. In the world of Cyberpunk, you might be becoming someone new every day, until, like Denny, you look back and don't recognize your old self. If you're not buying this whole aging thing, consider the poem recited by Alt in the game's ending. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing. But such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake. That's from Sailing to Byzantium, 
a poem by William Yates. It's about getting old, but specifically about a man who wants to escape from his dying body into an artifice of eternity. You know, like storing your consciousness in cyberspace forever. So is Johnny's journey or even Arasaka's Secure Your Soul program a commentary on this? Uh, not really. I mean, in the sense that it's warning you, don't let Amazon store your soul on their servers, sure. It's a nice poetic flourish for a game about aging and the pains of growing old, but for a game so obsessed with how intellectual it is, this still feels a bit lacking. Like, what is the message here? That preserving your soul in digital form is bad? That what we think of as human and inhuman is all wrong? These themes are pretty masterfully tackled in something like Westworld, but in the case of Cyberpunk, it just seems like a meditation on how much getting old sucks. And don't get me wrong, I dig the story. But for a game that wants to throw Friedrich Nietzsche, you know how it goes, stare too long into the abyss, the abyss will stare right back at you. And Aristotle quotes at you, the greatest crimes issue from a desire for excess and not from necessity. Say what now? Aristotle, guess you read me then. I don't think Cyberpunk is nearly as deep as it thinks it is. Sure, it can toss in a copy of Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls, pop in a Yeats poem that is thematically similar, and name missions after clever cultural references, but that's about as deep as it gets. And even for all its attempts to honor its cyberpunk roots, many have said that the game has failed in this respect. It might be quick to pay homage, but at times doesn't seem to understand its source material. It's a bummer because the game had everything it needed to do a really cool, mind-blowing story. It almost feels like if the game hadn't been so rushed, it might have succeeded. But overall, we're gonna call Cyberpunk a little dumb. We really did like the story, but like everything else about the game, we're left wondering what the team at CD Projekt Red could have done with a little more time. But what do you guys think? Was Cyberpunk a missed opportunity to explore what constitutes identity? Or should we put the philosophy books away while we're gaming? Let us know in the comments. Big thanks to all our patrons for all your support. Smack that like button like you're high-fiving a digital Keanu Reeves and don't forget to ring that bell. As always, thanks for watching. Peace.